Maybe the pinnacle of what makes human intelligence human is its open-endedness. Like, not problem-solving, but the, this tendency we have to explore. That's the whole point. Like, there wouldn't be humans if humans were the objective. That's what's so fascinating about it. Like, that's, then that's, that's a kind of interesting um, lesson for AI. It, it may be a cautionary tale. You know, like, the process that produced human intelligence was one that wasn't trying to make it. And if you look at the window and you see all the nature around you and you think about it, it was a single run of a single process that produced all of living nature. I mean, what could be more impressive than that? It's literally biblical, like what has been created here. This is Brain Inspired. Hey everyone, it's Paul. Deep learning is all about using some objective function to train a network. For example, minimizing the error between the correct answer and what the network produces. Uh, And often the objective is for the network to perform well on some benchmark task, like the ImageNet or MNIST data sets. Neuroscientists uh, make models and perform experiments with the objective of answering specific questions testing specific hypotheses about some brain function. And on we march, uh, making hard-won, steady progress, improving deep network performance by tenths of a percentage, creating models of brain processes that inch closer to accounting for some cognitive function. However, what if a better way forward, at least better for making big fundamental progress, is to not chase objectives but rather to let creativity and intuition drive the work that we do and take us in uncertain and potentially radically new directions. That's what Ken Stanley calls open-endedness, and he thinks it's a powerful and unfortunately neglected framework to apply to really ambitious problems like developing AI. Ken hasn't always known it's called open-endedness or called it uh, himself open-endedness, but going back to the early algorithms that he develops uh, in neuroevolution, evolving new neural networks as opposed to training a given neural network, uh, he's always been driven by the principles of open-endedness. He and Joel Lehman wrote a book about it called Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned, and Ken recently started an open-ended research team to develop AI uh, at his present company, OpenAI. So that's what we talk about, open-endedness. And this is a topic that applies to many facets of life. And I got so excited, I was a little more all over the place than usual, but that's okay. Uh, I think it went in many interesting directions. And I enlisted a couple past uh, podcast guests, Stefan Lanyon and Melanie Mitchell, to send some questions for Ken. So I play those. So that was fun. And this was a really fun conversation that um, you know maybe will inspire you to think about how open-endedness uh, might apply to many of your endeavors. As usual, you can find links to the things that we reference uh, in the show notes at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 86. If you value this podcast and you want to support it and hear the full versions of all the episodes and occasional separate bonus episodes, you can do that for next to nothing through Patreon. Go to braininspired.co and click the red Patreon button there. And here is Ken Stanley. Ken, I have three questions for you today. uh, And within those three questions, there are an infinite amount of things to discuss. So, uh, and and I also, in addition, have two surprise guest questions for you along the way. Great. So these, uh, these simple, (laughs) these simple questions are, uh, one, how do we achieve or solve, one might say, open-endedness? And of course, to get there, we'll talk about open-endedness. How is that related to achieving AI, whatever that is? Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, and where, if at all, does neuroscience uh, or understanding natural intelligence fit in? Mm-hmm. So I, I assume you have pretty straightforward answers to all three of those questions, right? <laughs> I can I can address those questions. I don't know if it's straightforward, but I can address them. Okay, so let's start with open endedness because um, I, I like this quote. You've you know you've given lots of talks on this, and at least one of the talks you end it with this quote: "To achieve our highest goals, we must be willing to abandon them." Yes. Uh, at least this was your last sentence. So right. what is the field of open-endedness uh, trying to achieve? And along the way, I guess we need to define what, or sort of define what open-endedness is. Right, right. Yes. Um, so <clears throat> open-endedness 
is really inspired by things that we observe in nature, um, which are what we call open-ended processes. <clears throat> and there's only a few, but they're like really amazing. Um, and the first, like maybe the most canonical is evolution or natural evolution, evolution on earth. Um, and the particular aspect of it that's so remarkable is just that it went on and on and on for more than a billion years and kept on inventing new stuff that's interesting. And we just don't know artificial processes that do things like that. We can't build them right now. Um, there's a very few machine learning algorithms, which is basically the field that I work in, where you would actually want to run them more than a week or a month, let alone a year or 10 years, let alone a million or billion years. Even on today's faster, more powerful computer Yeah, platform. which is, that, that's the funny thing. Yeah, we have this powerful compute. But even so, like it wouldn't be worth it to run for a billion years. Um, it just, there's, there's nothing would happen, you know, because <laughs> these algorithms eventually converge. So either it's good news or it's bad news, but either way, they, they're done. Like the good news is it converged to the solution. See, it's good. Um, the bad news is it got stuck. So now you're stuck. It's not good and it's stuck and it's ended. Um, but in open endedness, it, it, there is never the end. Um, that's what's interesting. It's called, that's why it's called open ended. Um, and the point is that it's something that's creative basically forever. And hopefully even in sort of like the grandest version, it's not just forever creative, but it gets even more interesting the longer it goes. Um, and so evolution's a bit like this, you know, with these kind of like relatively simple organisms early on, like single celled things. And then you get to stuff like human level intelligence, the flight of birds, photosynthesis, like all. And the thing that's amazing about this is all in one run. You know, we're used to things in, in machine learning where like, okay, I could get a bunch of interesting results, but they're probably separate experiments that just are ran mm. from scratch separately. This is all the same thing. It's all starting from the same root of the same phylogenetic tree. And so it's just, um, it's just a remarkable thing that this can even exist. But since we know it can, we'd like to be able to reproduce it. And there's more examples than just natural evolution. Like the other big one would be like the history of human civilization um, and human invention in particular, like human invention, mm -hmm. which includes things like art and music and science and everything that we've created. It's also a giant tree of discoveries that isn't heading anywhere in particular um, and is in effect kind of like one run. And it just kind of seems to keep getting more interesting. You know, we start out with things like wheels and fire and here we have like computers and space stations now. Um, and so it's just another amazing process. And so the question is, can we create artificial processes that have this property? And that's what I would call, yeah, open-ended processes. And I guess I would say, I'm sort of trying to coin a new term, strong open-endedness. Strong open-endedness oh, is goodness. like it never ends. Okay. Well, is that like strong AI? Is that why the... Yeah, I think... I started to think just how to make the distinction because there are, there are experiments that people have run where there's kind of like, um, some open end. It's like for a while it does some surprising stuff and that's cool. Like mm. I like, that's fun to watch, but it always just ends, you know, it doesn't go forever. So like strong open end is be like go forever just so that we can have a distinction here and say what we're really interested in achieving. Like the strong open end is just like way out there. Amazing. Like weak open end is like we can do that right now, but it's not quite as interesting. It's far from as interesting. I mean, you, you've been working on open-endedness for a long time now, and uh, you and Joel Lehman, is that his name? Joel Lehman, Your yeah. co-author? Yeah, yeah, Lehman, yeah. Joel Lehman, yeah, yeah. in uh, Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. Um, and that book, it, you guys describe um, open-endedness, and you end with uh, AI and with, uh, I think, human innovation. Is that right? As the two, ca no, is that right? No, evolution. AI and evolution, yeah. Evolution, yeah, yeah as the two uh, case studies, the two, the two big examples in that book. Right, right. And... Uh, I only see like super positive reviews uh, of that book. Mm. And it's almost, I, I, I wonder what you, first of all, is that true? <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, then, and then I wonder like, what do you make of just how positive the responses are to the book and just to open-endedness mm. um, in general? I, anytime I see a talk by you, you're always interrupted saying by someone saying, first of all, this is this is blowing my mind. And secondly, here's my question, which never right. happens in a talk. So, what do you what do you what do you make of it uh, of the positive response? And what does that say about you know our current era? Right, right. Yeah. So it's true that I've gotten a lot of positive feedback. Um, not everything is positive. I mean, just to acknowledge that you can find a few bad reviews here and there. Um, and in fact, <laughs> like I, I expected you know, there to be some negativity because the, the book was clearly polarizing. I mean, it's basically a challenge to the status quo, the status quo mm -hmm. that like 
most things should be objectively driven um, in our culture, in our society, like the way we run things. And and so a lot of people believe in this stuff. A lot of companies are run based on objectives. A lot of academic research is run based on objectives. And so I expected that they could ruffle some feathers to suggest that we shouldn't do that. I also expected some people would love it because it's basically like having a straitjacket and people don't really like it, even though we just impose it on ourselves. Um, so it's not surprising to me that there's a lot of people who are also very happy. Um, and But it's true that mostly I hear there's a lot of people happy. So I guess my conclusion is that <laughs> Is that this self-imposed straitjacket of just like objective obsession that is part of our culture is like one of those things that we did to ourselves without realizing we're doing it. Like most individuals don't like it, even the people involved in those systems. They just thought like it's necessary for some reason. Like I've got to satisfy, you know, my manager and let that manager like somehow know that they can trust me. And so I'm just going to subscribe to this and then I'll force my reports to do that also. And it all aligns together. And then suddenly the whole world is working this way. So I think the appeal of the book is is the message that like actually some things work better if you don't do it that way and take off the straight jacket and that's a liberating kind of a message. I mean you must get all sorts of crazy questions and you know <laughs> life experience stories like you know of course I I I listen to your talks I read the book and I think oh my my slacker young self all I was doing was being open ended <laughs> I wasn't I, I must have been yeah. doing something right, you know, so you must get all, all sorts of responses yeah. like that No, I, Yeah, well. I do. It, it's really interesting, the life stories that I've, I've gotten from this. It's, it's, it's really gratifying, actually, because as a computer scientist, it's like completely not what you expect in your career <laughs> to have like almost <laughs> yeah. therapeutic interactions with people. Well, I also thought you must be getting all sorts of invitations from like businesses. But then I thought, no, that can't be true because your message is antithetical to their <laughs> supposed progress, right? So they don't want you coming in and telling all of their employees to not uh, uh, obtain the objective. But uh, you, aren't you getting inundated with the self-help <laughs> uh, industry? Because this is this seems very self-help yeah. oriented as well. You know, that's an interesting question. Uh, that uh, it actually it sort of it sort of is the opposite of that. So like, really, businesses hmm. have have approached me, um, or more like business conferences. Um, like they've asked me to come talk to uh, you. There is a really unbelievable diversity of different kinds of communities that have asked me to talk. Like, I mean, I even spoke to um, the um, the retirement investment community. So the people who run our retirement accounts. Um, and you can oh. like, what does that book have to do with that? But like, what I've learned is that. Um, everywhere is looking for some form of disruption. Like the, people want to get out of their shell and like get out of the box and think of something new. And the book is just by its nature kind of about how to do that. And so like at the top mm -hmm. level, most people are interested in that, I think in like almost any industry. Um, and so it's not as resistant as you would think. Like there's very few kind of like bean counters that really, really believe in the like system of just metrics and objectives. There are a few, there's a few, but I think they're, they're pretty rare. They're like a caricature. Um, most people are just sick of it, um, that I've encountered. Even at the, even the administrators who are the gatekeepers, they're like people like that. Like when, when I get to talk to them, they're usually like, I just really don't know how to do something different here. Like tell me how to reorganize. I mean, I, yeah. I remember I went to one, one huge lab where they had almost a billion dollars that they were managing. And one of the first questions that, that the leader was asking me was like, well, how should I reorganize how we allocate all these funds? And I was like, this is a, a, a crazy <laughs> question. Like, I don't, I'm going to tell you how to like reallocate your funds in this gigantic organization. <laughs> um, and so I think it's just like people don't really, hadn't really realized there is an alternative. It's just like, this seems like the only really viable way to go. Um, is like, yeah, of course there needs to be accountability. How could we live in a, how could we live in an organization without accountability? And objectives provide accountability and metrics tell us how we're doing on those objectives. And so mm -hmm. while we don't enjoy it and we don't like it and we wish we could be all freewheeling and interesting, like when it comes down to it, most people are like really uncertain, like what that really means that's actually going to work in practice. I mean, have there been particularly challenging criticisms that, that have, you've taken to heart and, um, that that have, has challenged your intellect to challenge yeah. the, the framework of open endedness. Yeah, I think like the biggest question. I don't know if I'd really call it a criticism, but it, it's kind of critical. Is is just how do you control it? To the constraints. It relates to constraints, well, but it's sort of like the whole yeah. theme of this is just like to 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 let you just do what you want, 
Um, or or to, if you think about it from an AI perspective, it's basically saying, let an algorithm just go off and dither around and, and find interesting stuff. Um, but we're not going to tell it what to do. But like everybody wants to tell things what to do. Like ultimately we want, we do want to tell things what to do. Like I want this vacuum cleaner to clean my room, not to just explore around and find interesting things to do. Like it's, that's what it's supposed to do. Um, and so like people at first are like, this is super exciting. Like we can, we can like find new things we didn't think of, but then they're like, but how do I control it? Like I want it to do X. And there's a tension, there's a tension there. I mean, even, even outside of algorithms, like when we talk about the book and just like how you run like an innovative organization, it comes up also because like people are like, well, I can let my employees kind of explore around in some way. Um, but then how do we get anything done? Like what, what is actually? Well, but isn't this like Google's 20, is it 20% rule? I forget what it was yeah, I forget or is. the exact number, but it is like yeah. that. Yeah. Like that kind of thing. It's, it feels dangerous because you're like, well, how do I then channel that back to like our, our company goals and back to objectives? Like at some point we have some yeah. objective. And so, yeah, there's a bit of uncertainty. What does it mean to control something where like the, the main property of that thing is that it's not something you control? Um, and, and that's a paradox and, um, it leads to tension. And, uh, you know, I recognize that that, that is something to be uncomfortable about. Um, but I think, um, the answer is just that, that there are, there's trade-offs and you just to, to decide where you fall along those trade-offs. Like you're never going to get both. You can't have total control and total creativity at the same time. That just doesn't happen. So you'd have to at least recognizing the trade-off is useful at the get-go, but then, you know, you can, you can have compromises. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Well, you repeatedly emphasize that really what open-endedness is good for is for ambitious goals. And, you know, in your vacuum cleaner example, that is not exactly an ambitious goal. If you if the solution is to clean the floor, you don't want your vacuum cleaner like mine did last night, getting stuck and then running out of batteries. Um, yeah. You know, because it's yeah. exploring, right? Yeah, so, there, yeah. so there's a trade-off there as well, correct? That is, yeah. And that is an important distinction. Yeah, like in, in a lot of the, I think people who didn't like the book um, that that's one of the things that, that they missed is that we're talking only about really ambitious stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's true. Like we, we never said, and I never thought that like we should eliminate all objectives from, from the world or that things that aren't super ambitious should somehow just turn into like creative activities where you just wander around aimlessly and hope something happens. Like if you want to make a sandwich, then make a sandwich. <laughs> I have some pretty ambitious sandwich designs, right. my friend. Well, yeah. but okay. But I mean, it, it, it it, we even acknowledge this in the first chapter. I mean, we were we were aware that, that people would say things like that, and that, that that's like a straw man that they would attack. Like that people would say, "This is extreme." Like this, they're saying that we should never do these things. Look at all the useful things we've done with objectives. But we know that it, we're not saying that there's never been anything useful. We're talking about things where we're making really, really, uh, you know, blue sky discoveries here, and those are the kinds mm. of things where the objectives are not going to serve you well. I mean, it is so. Just conceptually, it's difficult to grasp. I mean, you yourself have said, maybe we don't need to define it per se, but it's even somewhat difficult to characterize it. And I, I came up with mm. a, an equation here, mm. uh, and, and you can correct me, So, or a recipe, we'll okay, say. Yeah. Um, so it has to be highly ambitious to, you know, for open-endedness to uh, work. Um, it has to be highly ambitious. You have to have some intrinsic motivation, because you can't just kind of sit around whittling a stick and hope something will happen right? You have to have motivation to explore and you have to truly be seeking novelty. And, and we can talk about your novelty mm -hmm. search algorithms and what that has led to and the concept of divergence. Mm -hmm. um, but then the last part of the recipe is, is valuing interesting findings. And so we, can, we need to talk about what interesting means. <laughs> Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that is that close? Is that a close recipe? That is those are those are good ingredients, but I think it sort of depends on what you're trying to cook a little bit, you know, cuz there's different there's different places where you would do something open-ended and it might just be a subset of those that apply. Like for example, like natural evolution um, you know, isn't curious. Like it just cuz it's not a, a, an entity. Um and yet it is open-ended. Um, but like when, when humans are, are reinforcement learning agents are engaged in sort of exploratory, playful discovery, then they may be motivated intrinsically by curiosity. Um, and so like there's a certain context dependence to these ingredients, but each one of those ingredients is, is one of the kind of, um, is one of the things that it's, it's, it's one of the um, weapons in the arsenal, so to speak, that you could use. But I don't think you always need all of them. Well, but you could say that evolution is, uh, highly motivated to, 
uh, explore the search space of of possible lives of possible uh, configurations mm-hmm. that have high fitness or whatever within within the constraints of survive and reproduce, mm-hmm. like you've mentioned. So maybe yeah. not. Maybe that's a uh, maybe the teleology of being highly motivated doesn't fit with the evolution story, but you can make a case. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, that's. I mean, and that gets a little bit into semantics, I guess. Yeah, like what do we mean sure. by motivated? Yeah. Is does it have to be like a person, or is it going to be like a thing? Um, but yeah, the, it, if you look at it that way, you can interpret it that way. But I think what really matters is ultimately like the more algorithmic questions than, than like it's that's more like a matter of interpretation. Like, do we do we think of the process as being motivated to to discover things? We could or we could not. But the real question is, what makes it motivated? Like, what is the what are the actual algorithmic mechanisms that allow something to diverge like this? Um, and that's when it gets into like real implementation. Like, how do you actually get an open ended process going? Um, but yeah, the, the the things you mentioned are are kind of the things that that we touch on. So it's a good list. Yeah, it's a little hard to digest the whole list at once, probably. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't I don't really want to step through them, you know, because we're going to be talking about all of it you sure, know, sure. along the way. Yeah, yeah. Something you said um, already previously, uh, just shortly before, you have people in business talking, asking you, like, I don't really know how to move forward, like what, yeah. how to be creative in the work environment. And it immediately made me think of AI and the current... So, so there's a deep learning explosion, and a lot of people think uh, that they're, it's kind of coming up against a wall. I mean, that there's still a lot of progress being made, mm. but on the whole, you're still making a modicum, modicum of improvement on these benchmark tests, mm-hmm. which is antithetical mm-hmm. to open-endedness. Yeah. So in a sense, this is a, uh, could be a, a blessing for the AI uh, world as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I come from that world, so it was actually like with starting with the observations in AI um, that eventually led to this like larger theory that applies to more than just AI. Um, and so, you know, the thing is, it's true that um, in AI um, that we tend to be very benchmark driven. That that's part of the culture. Um, and that's very objective and, and it's also underwhelming and not exciting. And even the people in the field know that, but they still try to beat the benchmark anyway, because sometimes it's hard to think of what else to do, but I, I'll tell you what else to do. Um, to me, like that isn't really progress. Like that is, well, or it's, at least it's not the kind of progress that interests me. Um, but the kind of progress that interests me is the invention of new playgrounds. Like what I think is really, really interesting in AI is when an entirely new playground appears, which is a very rare event. And performance doesn't even matter. That's the problem with performance metrics. Like, you know, a new playground when you see one and you can criticize the heck out of it and give all kinds of reasons. It doesn't work really well and it doesn't beat this thing on this benchmark, but it still created a whole new world of low hanging fruit of ideas that like nobody would have considered if it hadn't come into fruition. Um, and so I'm really, yeah, I'm really interested in, in creating new playgrounds, which is basically like stepping stones, which is related to this kind of theory of open endedness is the discovery of a new stepping stone opens up a whole new frontier of possibilities. And those are things that I would consider to be progress, like in the field of AI. What do you consider progress for yourself personally? You mean, in, is it professionally or just like a, as in like my normal yeah, life? Yeah, like how, like at the end of a day, do you, what makes you feel like you've made progress? Yeah. Is it, is it if you've done something interesting or novel, you know? Hmm. Well, I think it's, yeah, it's the playground thing. Like if I could open up a new playground, then that's like probably the most exciting thing. Like it's like a whole new world has been created of possibilities. Yeah, I would like to do that. It does seem like what you do is fun. Is it fun? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, I've definitely enjoyed most of what I've been doing. I mean, yeah, from the research, I have enjoyed it. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. I mean, trying to do open end stuff. Open end is, is associated with play. So thinking about it a lot is like thinking about playing. I mean, you, you come from a, you know, you, you've created a bunch of evolutionary algorithms. And I mean, you come from a deep background of machine learning and you've developed these novelty search algorithms along the way to, um, to push toward uh, open endedness. I, I mean, so. Well, let's talk about creativity for a second. Yeah. I mean, there's just so many different avenues that we could go down. So I don't, I'm not even, I don't even know if we've uh, established a, a good baseline for people to understand what open-endedness is yet. Fair enough. Uh, we could address it a little more, I guess. Like, what, what is open-endedness? Like, I, I, would, I wanted to acknowledge, like, there, there is a community that was interested in open-endedness for, for, like, decades, like, maybe 30 years, yeah. which, which they call them, themselves the open-ended evolution community. Well, they don't use the word community, but open-ended evolution. And... um They've been discussing a lot of these issues for a long time and they have, they have workshops, but it, it was very tethered to the word evolution. Um, and the community stayed small. 
Um, and so I don't like I want to say that like sort of I own the idea and sort of own the definition. Like there's all this right. has been discussed for a long time. Um, but I think what the the kind of realization that I had was just that why is this community so small? Like it seemed like this is like the coolest topic ever. Um, it's so interesting and. I just like within the last five years or something just was like, I got to do something about this. Like this, there should be like many, like 10 times more people investigating this. Um, and so when it comes to definition, I think I'm more concerned with why is this so interesting than what is the particular definition? Because I, in my experience in that community, there was a lot of argument about definition. Um, there's also an AI. There was a lot of argument. Like what is, what is intelligence really? What sure. is it? And yeah. this has never been resolved. And what I think is interesting is it didn't need to be resolved. Like there's been plenty of progress without resolving the question of what is intelligence. Um, it helps to have some discussion. I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about it at all, but I just don't think there needs to be some like definitive final answer to like the definition. It's something you know when you see. And if you look at the window and you see all the nature around you and you think about it, it was a single run of a single process that produced all of living nature. I mean, what could be more impressive than that? It's literally biblical, like what has been created here. I mean, it's creation. <laughs> yeah. So like yeah. yeah we could we could get into the nitty-gritty semantics of what is it actually about but it's just it's something incredible. The whole point well one of the big points is that there's no objective to that uh, creation to that biblical creation there was no objective. Uh I mean I don't know uh, humans right that's the objective <laughs> right of evolution right that's we're the top tip of the arrow yeah. of evolution. I mean, that's one thing I I strictly like to say we it's not what it is cuz that's <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole point. Like, there wouldn't be humans if humans were the objective. That's what's so fascinating about it. Like, that's then that's that's a kind of interesting um, lesson for AI. It, it may be a cautionary tale. You know, like the process that produced human intelligence was one that wasn't trying to make it. Like, there's nothing in the in the ingredients of the initial run of evolution, like at the beginning of time, where you could say this is trying to produce a brain. That would be crazy. You can't extrapolate that far out. It's it's some kind of like orthogonal happenstance, like that isn't on, isn't really directly related to the constraints of the system from the beginning, which is survive and reproduce. You give a lot of examples of, you know, things like that have happened in the past that are examples of open endedness, like vacuum tubes weren't created to make computers, but are necessary for computers. You're, um, I'm yeah. not going to make you recapitulate the pick breeder story, but you mm -hmm. put this, um, this little applet th th thing on the web where people can go and like, uh, click on an image that they like, and then it turns into like that's becomes the child and turns into a bunch of different images. And you do yeah. this over and over and over, and people can share their different journeys and stuff. And th th you end up with these images that are very impressive, but not but not what you were striving for. So if you were striving for a particular image, you're going to end up with Jupiter with uh, its um, mm -hmm. storm spot on it, for instance. And who knows what that person or yeah. team was striving for. You've ended up with some interest, like a car, I yeah, think, that yeah. you've ended up with without intentionally doing it. Right, yeah. So you end up with, so open. this is an open-ended process, and you end up with interesting things, things you didn't expect that might be useful for, for something else. But how important is it that the end product is useful, does something? Is usefulness part of interesting? Well, I guess... That's, um, I mean, it is, it is, the answer to that is, is, is partly related to just what do you care about? I mean, if we're going to artificially trigger an open-ended process, we, we might ask why, why are we doing this? If it's just to see things that are interesting, then they, maybe they don't have to be useful unless your definition of interesting means it's useful. Well, you must, usefulness must, you know, you, you get a kick out of it. I guess that's useful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if that's what you're hoping, then, then yeah, you, you're hoping that everything basically will be useful if that's what it means. Um, and it, like getting a kick out of it is useful. Then, then yeah, hope, hopefully everything gives you a kick. <laughs> or like, actually, I shouldn't say that. Hopefully a lot of stuff gives you a kick because we're, we're okay with some stepping stones that don't satisfy anything. Right. Um, like right. the stepping stones are useful in their own right because they got you to that place where you got a kick out of it. Um, so it's not like every single thing you traverse has to itself be great. Um, but you should get some, you should get to places that are really interesting at some point. Well, that's like an, an activation energy that you have to uh, get over to get to the interesting point. Yeah, you could look at it that way. You said evolution is an open-ended process and uh, mm -hmm. apologies. I'm kind of all over the place, but I have, oh, you know, about a billion thoughts on these things yeah. as, as everyone does, I'm sure. But th I've also heard you said that evolution sort of cheats us. Uh, out of many of the of its potential interesting end products, mm -hmm. because the thing that it creates does not survive and reproduce. Mm -hmm. And who knows if that thing 
that it created that didn't survive and reproduce wasn't a stepping to- stone to something potentially even yeah. better or you know more interesting. Yeah, yeah. I have talked about that. This is a subtle issue. Um but it's about the uh, w- it's about the constraints, you know, and that this is something people often get confused is the difference between a constraint and objective. Like in evolution it's true that everything has to survive and reproduce. So a lot of people think, well, that must be an objective then. Like the objective is to survive and reproduce. So it's like we're trying to get to that point. But but I think you have to remember that an objective, at least I think from from a machine learning perspective, is a place that you don't start where you're already there. Um, like it's somewhere you move towards. And the thing is, the very first organism must have survived and reproduced by definition, right? Because like mm-hmm. here we are. Um, so the problem was solved at step one. Um, so that doesn't really mesh with the, the usual conventional notion of an objective. And that's because, at least in my view, it's not an objective. Um, rather, it's just a constraint. Like we're already there from the beginning, but the constraint says that we have to stay there. Like every single thing ever that's going to perpetuate more search has to also satisfy that constraint. Um, mm-hmm. And so, so it, it basically is a pruning mechanism. So it's saying like, what are we not going to look at rather than what we are? I'd better think of it as a not. Like we're not going to look at things that don't have basically Xerox machines inside their stomach like copying machines, like basically we're walking copying machines. And the only things that you can perpetuate are walking copying machines. And if you're not a walking copying machine, we don't care how interesting you are, you're out of the game. Um, and yeah, so that means all those things that were interesting, but like couldn't reproduce, you know, are gone. Um, those lineages have never been explored. Um, and this is just a theoretical thing. Cause I mean, practically, obviously they can't be because they can't reproduce. Right. But like theoretically, like, you know, you could imagine from a computational perspective, something could let it reproduce anyway. Like we could mutate their, their genome and like artificially inseminate something and put it out there. Like that could be that science fiction. But like from a computational perspective, like we're talking about algorithms there, it isn't science fiction because like in evolutionary algorithms, you can just make anything reproduce you want. It's completely up to us. So that means that there's this lost opportunity, like all these things that have been pruned out of the search. But the way to think about it is like um, that the constraint to me is the thing that ensures that things are interesting. Um, Like it is possible to have a constraint that would admit lots of crap that isn't interesting. You know, Mm -hmm. like, like what if the constraint was just, you have to get to a minimal mass in order to reproduce. So in other words, like if you get above a certain mass, then like, you know, God will come and make a child for you. You don't need to have reproductive organs or anything. Like you'll just get a child. Um, well, I would say the world would be pretty uninteresting. There'd be all these inert masses literally everywhere. But this is still the world of DNA. I mean, it's still going to be organisms on Earth. Um, but it would be junk. Um, and, and so something about survive and reproduce is ensuring that like everything's interesting. It's true that it prunes out other things that could have been interesting because there's plenty of things that have been alive that were really interesting, but just never managed to reproduce. Um, but at least everything that did reproduce was interesting. Um, and that's why nature is so interesting. At least to me, like everything's interesting. Every, there's not an organism on earth that isn't interesting. And that's because of this constraint. But if we widen it and make it less constrained, we get more stuff, but we also admit some things perhaps that aren't interesting as we get less constrained. So there's some trade off. Like we could fill the world with inert blobs. I mean, if it is so useful, if open-endedness is so useful, why has why hasn't uh, evolution done that? Uh, like, it's that's a very teleological statement there. Like, um, you mean expanded its notion? Like allowed allowed for uselessness for a few stepping stones in order yeah. to achieve usefulness. <laughs> well, um, yeah, that's. I mean, because I think it's because evolution doesn't care about any of this. It's not. A, it's not a concern to it. Whether it's not something even a is, thing. Yeah. yeah, it's not. It's it's not trying to do anything. So it just is what it is. Um, it, this is the, but that question does come up in artificial evolution then, you know, cause then, then we yeah. actually, we're deciding what we care about and someone does care. So then we have to confront these kind of questions. Like, what do we actually want it to do? One of the things I, that I appreciate that you, uh, appreciate and your work has, um, highlighted this recently is the importance of the environment, environmental constraints, right? And so the question is, how do you achieve true open-endedness that will create enough complexity forever? to be able to then generate new things forever and Mm -hmm. potentially interesting things forever. And you've started, at least the the latest that I know, you're you're, you're making mazes and A, so it's a co-evolution algorithm where your your agent is trying to solve the maze uh, in an open-endedness fashion, but then you're also developing new mazes. So there's a co-evolution of the maze itself and the agent trying to solve it. Do I have that right? 
Yeah, yeah, that that's the uh, minimal criterion coevolution that I uh, did with Jonathan Brandt. Yeah, and that and there's also something else that I worked on um, with colleagues at Uber AI Labs, which was uh, called Poet or the Paired Open Ended Trailblazer, which also mm-hmm. uh, also involve evolves environments. And yeah, it's it's getting towards this issue of, you know, I mean, if if you look at things like novelty search, they're really about exploring the space of solutions. You could think of it as like different behaviors, but like there needs to be another side to this, which is like, what are the actual things there are, that are there to do in the world? Like opportunities. In other words, like what are the opportunities to do something new? Like you can look for new things to do all day, but like if I lock you in a room and there's nothing in the room, there's only so many new things you can do. You have to get out of that room and find something new to do. Um, and so like a lot of the environments that we create in, in artificial systems are, are, are like this kind of locked room. Like there's, there's only so much that can happen and then it's kind of over. So we need something that, that somehow gets environmental diversity also at the same time as we're getting solution diversity. Um, and those algorithms are beginning to explore that question and recognizing just how important that is, that opportunities also have to come out. And, you know, evolution on earth does this by making the organisms, both opportunities and solutions. And so that's kind of cool. It's like a little bit self-referential, you know, because like mm-hmm. a tree is a solution. Like it's a way of life and a way of surviving. But it's also an opportunity for somebody to eat leaves. So you can have a giraffe. Um, and so it's both. It's both a solution and an opportunity. And then the giraffe makes an opportunity for something else, I guess, to, to eat the giraffe. Um, and so, right. <laughs> so that's why evolution has been able to keep going for like a billion years is because it's not just generating solutions. It's also generating opportunities. Well, it's highly complex and highly recursive, somewhat, mm-hmm. somewhat like the brain. This reminds me of Stuart Kaufman's uh, concept of the adjacent uh, possible. Are you familiar? Yeah, 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 yeah. I see the connection. I mean, this is the same, you know, he, his more recent, um, thought processes or I guess talks that he gives, um, talk about the unboundedness of uh, complexity and and just just in the way that you just spoke about it, that uh, an organism, that different opportunities are afforded as things develop. Uh, one opportunity or one develop, one evolutionary development, he uses the, uh, the uh, swim bladder, for instance, which then can uh, evolve and then can become mm-hmm. a, a habitat for a new microbe or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then that is a completely new thing in the universe and it's generative yeah. and creative in that respect. So it really crosses with that yeah, sort of concept. Yeah. I think Stuart Kaufman and I probably would, would get along well. We've never actually spoken to each other, but we obviously, we have some similar interests. Um, and I kind of think of this adjacent possible, it's a little bit more like the how, whereas I think I'm a little bit more talking about the what. It's like, mm. like, it's more like explanatory is how I think of it. He might disagree. Maybe I'm mischaracterizing, but it's sort of like, how can you explain how this could be possible? Like, how could all this stuff have happened? Well, it's because of this notion of adjacent possible. Like there's the search space has this very intriguing property that like, there's these really uh, a counterintuitive adjacent hops that you can take um, from certain points in the search space to other points that just aren't what we would expect. And you can, it's almost completely unpredictable. Um, and this sort of explains how it's possible for all this stuff to exist. But it also raises questions philosophically, like, why is the search space that way? That's just like an amazing property of the universe. It's like yeah. a prior property. Evolution doesn't explain that. Evolution uses that. Searches that, yeah. And then, like, I think I'm more like, when, when I, the stuff I'm talking about is more like, well, what are the ingredients you need like to actually implement something like this? So it's less philosophical and more kind of like, what's the algorithmic formula here like to really do this? Um, mm-hmm. And so I feel like it's sort of complementary, like, which is why I think we would have a good discussion. Okay. So one more question here about open-endedness, and then I'm going to play a question <laughs> for you. And this is more about, uh, you know, creativity and, and the idea of an objective. So just as as an example, vacuum tubes. I don't know what vacuum tubes were innovated or invented for. Do, mm-hmm. do you happen to know? Yeah, I, I did research this, so I might be getting a little fuzzy, but I believe that originally they were just used for uh, experiments with electricity. Um, okay. Like people so they were invented yeah. for a purpose with mm-hmm. an ob- objective in mind. So this is a case, though, where, you know, this is an example where the the product that eventually was used in a different framework to, to build computers actually did come from an objective driven pursuit. And I'm wondering if, so open-endedness is, is a natural 
way to think about creativity and how to be creative, how to generate creativity. But I'm wondering if creativity would occur regardless of whether there's an objective. Right. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that objectives, you can have creativity uh, with objectives, um, but it's much more likely to be, um, it's much less likely, I should say, it's less likely that you would have creativity with objectives. Um because like, let's look at, there's like an old joke about grants, like when scientists apply for grant funding that like, you know, the best thing to do is propose what the panel wants to hear, which is the objective. Um, and then just do whatever you really wanted to do once you get the money. Um, <laughs> yeah. and that just, I think exposes the fraud of this, like the, the subjective stuff. It's just a, it's, it's basically a security blanket to make everybody feel like we're actually on some kind of track. But the truth is the cool stuff happens off the track. Does that mean that like there's no exceptions? I mean, of course there's exceptions. There's going to be some exceptions, but there's a general rule. Like this is actually a better, a stronger principle is when you're getting off the track. Now, if you think about like your example and like you getting, you have objectives, um, but you still lead to something kind of interesting, but you have to recognize that what really happened there is still ultimately not very objective because it's usually, it's a serendipity. Like it's like, well, I was working on this thing, but actually it turned out that the thing that was really useful about it, about it wasn't what I was trying to do. It wasn't the objective. It's like the computer is not what the vacuum tube people were trying to build. So that step was actually a non-objective step, not an objective step. Um, and you, and basically the creativity happened when you abandoned your objective, you let it go. Um, so a lot of people have gone down a path that was objective and just had serendipity and realized that something else is possible here. Um, and I think that falls into this kind of non-objective interpretation. This, this goes back to the being motivated, intrinsically motivated. And I'll use a quote you, you gave in, in the book. Um, this is, you know, Pasteur's quote about uh, being prepared. Fortune right. favors the prepared mind. And that seems important that you're at least pushing forward and, and really I don't know. It just seems to be a, an important ingredient for me. The, the work, the, the doing something seems important. Yeah. Like that's also like, you know, in the book we, we say serendipity is not an accident. So it's a kind of a similar notion. And yeah. it's, 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 it's true that pushing forward is a form of prepared mind. I guess I would agree with that. And, but there's also just like, I find it really interesting when I look like at Wikipedia's serendipity page, cause there's like a, a serendipity Serendipity. I think it has like a bunch of inventions and things and like all kinds of serendipitous oh, discoveries. Okay. Oh, yeah. And it's really fascinating to look at it. Like all these things people weren't trying to do that they accidentally did. Um, but like microwaves, for example, microwave ovens, well, like there is somebody that's was research radar. For you. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. So, <laughs> but one interesting thing about it is there's that everybody seems to be really smart and have a good track record. Like all these people who had accidents, you know, so how could this be an accident? Like if they're accidents, then it shouldn't have to correlate with how smart you are. Like, like probably the best person for having an accident is, is some lunatic on the street running into the walls on the side of the road. Um, <laughs> you know, they're going to have lots of accidents, but it's not, that's not what serendipity is really about. I mean, the prepared mind means that you are opportunistic is what I think. So it's basically, you are willing to switch on a dime and you can see when new opportunities arise. And that's where real genius is. I think like, it's not vision. Like people like visionaries. They think geniuses are visionaries who like saw 15 steps ahead of the horizon. I don't think of it that way. I think it's that the geniuses are the people who actually realized that there is something one stepping stone away before anyone else realized it. It's like we have the thing we need right now. It could change the world, but no one has yet seen the connection. I mean, everyone has had an example. The, uh, everyone's career path is defined by this. No one is. No one thought when they were seven that they're here's here's my path, and then they followed it. But they might have started following something that was interesting, which led to something else. So everyone mm -hmm. has experienced this, uh, and yet we don't we don't uh, follow it in many other aspects of our life. It's true. It's, it's also a personal thing. Yeah. It's not just about like discovery in this kind of like big, um, grandiose form. It's like about your individual life too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. a lot of it is, is non-objectively driven. Um, I'm not sure everyone is ever, is ever, like maybe well, some people really just stuck to the plan from day one, but, but yeah, I think for most people, yeah, there's a process of discovery and I think life is open-ended. People are open-ended individuals, not just us as a society, but just your whole, your individual life. And because of that, that is an aspect of human intelligence that also needs to be needs to be understood and, and thought about. And celebrated. And celebrated for sure, yeah. Okay, so question number one here from an old old uh, podcast guest. This is uh, okay. Stefan Linyan. Uh, he, he uses AI um, to 
uh, generate creative things. So he, he studies creativity and wants to harness the power of AI mm. to study creativity. So, oh, cool. uh, so here's his question. Hi, Ken. In your work, you talk about open-endedness, both in nature and in artificial intelligence. Now, nature, of course, has been an inspiration to many, if not all, AI techniques. Obvious examples being genetic algorithms that are based on evolutionary processes and neural networks inspired by the stuff our brains are made of. Yet in these cases, we use a rather simplified understanding of how nature works, typically resorting to mechanical explanations that, as you say, work towards some kind of optimization or a predefined goal. So my question to you is as follows. To make progress in AI towards open-endedness, do we need to adopt new models of biological processes that do justice to open-endedness in nature? Or is the challenge even more profound? And does the way we build artificial systems fundamentally obstruct open-endedness? Like the way we store an analog signal that contains a potentially infinite amount of information as a binary digit. All right, you get all that? Yeah, interesting, interesting question. Thanks for that question. So, um, but the first part of the question is uh, about, do we need to change something about how our algorithms reflect what's happening in nature? Um, and I think, it, so that's, a, that's, a, that's the sort of um, easier part of the question. And I think that, that one's a clear yes. Um, but, but like we have <laughs> yeah. to realize that I think part of the point here is we don't understand what's happening in nature. Like that's why if we, if we did, we would just make the algorithm work that way. But is are the current algorithms up to date with what we do understand about nature? I mean, of course, mm. it's an open ended process, yeah. uh, you know, pushing forward, right? Because what you know, AI doesn't doesn't incorporate brain stuff at all. Yeah, is it? That's that's true. That like you could ask, you know, how up to date are we with with our current understanding? Um, and I would just say that we're continually understanding nature better. So at any moment in time, you know, it's probably we have we have a better understanding than we did a, a few years before, and and the algorithms will accordingly be a little bit better. Um, but we're still not there. We're still not at the point where I think we fully understand nature. Like nature, the problem is that like you have all these textbooks that explain evolution. Like you read them in high school or maybe in college, and um, mm -hmm. and that's to, that's like a message that we understand it. Like here's the explanation. It's simple. It's like one chapter. Um, like there there you go. Like all of these profound things have been explained. But the problem is that that's that explanation is not the same as a full understanding. Um, cause that's just an explanation. That's not the same as, as a formula or an algorithm. Like to me, like to really understand would be to have the algorithm. And that just is elusive. The algorithm of nature. Um, like we can do evolutionary algorithms, but nobody really thinks an evolutionary algorithm is the same thing as evolution in nature. They're inspired by it. They have some reflection of it, but it's just a shadow of it ultimately. Um, and so there's something we're missing. Um, and we are continually gaining more insight into what we're missing. Like I think now I know more about what's really going on in nature than I did like 15 years ago. Mm. But like I still think there's things that we don't fully grasp or understand or else we would just do them because if we really understood it, we would just write it down as an algorithm and we, we can't and we haven't and have failed to do that. And so it leads to the next part of the question of, is there something even more profound going on here? Like we're in the world of binary and digital, but we really need to be in the world of analog. Um, that's way more deep. And I think, um, I, th I, I don't know. I don't know. Cause I don't know what I don't know, but I would, if I had to guess, yeah. I would say no. I think that the, at least for open-endedness. Now, there may be other parts of nature where we're off kilter, like maybe consciousness or something. Maybe that can't be done through digital computation. But for open-endedness, I believe it should be doable um, with digital computers. I think we have the substrate we need, and I think that we, we can conquer this. Well, I think that wasn't his... Uh, uh, that was like a specific... The digital analog was a specific example he gave, but... Right. Uh, but but I think he was asking more about our, our biases, right? Um, mm. to, just to think about everything as goal driven um and whether we can even escape that even if we mm. are aware of it right oh, and I see. Uh, you know whether we're asking the right questions or if we're limited by that that um by our approach mm. by our biases and stuff that yeah that's a different angle on it i didn't think of it that way interesting i think um no i i mean i, I don't think we are like fundamentally limited by those biases like we have we do come with these biases but but i just think we're flexible enough to get around them i mean that's I mean, I'm getting around them. Uh, so 
Uh, I think it's, it's, there's nothing like fundamental about the human mind where it can't think in other ways. Um, may, may take a little flexibility, but I, I think we have it. Um, so, so I think, I think we can do this. Yeah. I'm probably stretching his intended question anyway, but, uh, yeah, fair enough. I don't want to necessarily ascribe that to him, but it's still an interesting angle, uh, to think about. Yeah. Um, so, but do you think that we are incorporating like what we, what we do understand about, uh, you know, nature and evolution mm-hmm. and the algorithms that we do understand, are we incorporating them well enough? Well, I guess, yeah, that's a good question. Cause I, I guess that that's more like a practical question because it's like, what is the community actually doing? And, yeah. you know, I would, as, I would situate myself as somewhat of a rebel in that respect that like, I really want to do that. And and others are more kind of um, satisfied to move in a more conventional way. So, so some of us are, 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 are not uh, constrained in that way, but, but I guess you could say that in general, AI has been more conventional minded and less oriented towards open-endedness. So yeah, we're, we're not, if we say we, I mean like the whole AI community, then we're not really, we're not really taking this to heart yet that much. But I think we're, we're we're moving in that direction because of the fact that it's becoming more and more popular to discuss. Um, and I see the word coming up more. Um, and like, it's also true that people in AI seem to like it when they hear about it. It's like they didn't even think about it before. Um, but when they hear about it, they're like, that actually is really interesting. And so I, I think it's going to kind of like um, spread a little bit and, 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 and you'll see it like growing inside the AI community. It seems like it's exploding, but I'm biased because I've been learning about it <laughs> you know so but and given all the positive responses you know some of the comments why isn't this everywhere already right. things like that nature that must give you uh, you must be optimistic uh, about the progress <laughs> yeah that's an interesting question like it's about yeah it's kind of like a strategic issue or a meta question about the like how is this going to actually spread around um <laughs> and it's it's um i think it's, it is spreading. And so, you know, is it exploding? It's kind of a, a matter of opinion, what we call an explosion. Sure. Like it's definitely increasing in, in people's interest, but, but it's still a small minority. I think of like the whole community. Like if you look at all of deep learning or even all of machine learning, like you're not, most people are not even thinking about open endedness. So fair enough. That, that's still true, I think. So there's still a lot of room for an explosion. Um, and I do, I do think that it deserves more mind share than it's still getting even now. And I think it's, you know, why is it not getting it is, is partly because there's a very practical orientation to the field where it's just like, how do we solve problem X? Um, yeah. and, and that's a lot of the way that we validate which direction to pursue and where to put money, which ultimately determines which research actually yeah. gets done. So open endedness doesn't really serve that very well. Like open endedness is really about like, well, let's just see what happens if we don't know what's going to happen. And that's like super interesting, but I can't guarantee you that like, you know, your telephone call center is going to be 3% more efficient next year. Um, <laughs> and so like, that's just like, yeah, it doesn't align with this culture of sort of practical problem solving. Um, but it may align with the idea of getting to something like AGI. I mean, then like this, this is a more grandiose thing where like these kinds of more philosophical issues come into play in real, in reality. Um, but like in just like the general culture of the field, it doesn't, it doesn't align perfectly with it. So I think that's the limiting factor. Let's see while we're okay. So we, let me go ahead and play the the next question because it's related to natural um, processes and applying them. Okay. So this is Melody Mitchell, um, oh, cool. complexity scientist. You're familiar with her. Um, I'll just play the question. Great. This is Melanie Mitchell. My question is this. You've brought a lot of new ideas to the field of evolutionary computation, especially as applied to neural networks. I'm wondering what you think are the most important new ideas for evolutionary computation that come from biological inspirations, but haven't been used yet in the field. Thank you. Well, I just want to say hi to Melanie, because I I, (laughs) I have met her and know her, and 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 it's cool to get a question from her, um, and I really like her work. So yeah, so coming from the biological side, where where are the opportunities um, in evolutionary computation? I think that what's, what's useful is to reinterpret um, biology outside of the conventional way of explaining it. So I don't know if that exactly answers the way Melanie is thinking of it. What do you think of the conventional way? Uh, 
Yeah. What, what, what is the conventional? I think we have a sort of a conventional narrative about what evolution is in nature. So thinking really about biology and nature, just forgetting algorithms yeah. for the moment. But like in nature, we think of it as a kind of death match. Like you get this, this term survival of the fittest. And it's like there's a competition going on. It's very competitive. Like the, the, the narrative is competitive. Um, and we, we don't really question that. That's a pretty well. I mean, after, you know, you go to high school, that's sort of like the idea you get. Like you are the product of like millions of years of brutality. And now we've got this super hyper optimized being that can take on the world. Um, and I think that that narrative is not necessarily helpful algorithmically. Like when you think about importing what we see in nature to, to algorithms that are artificial and, and, and useful to us and powerful in open-ended ways, um, that net narrative isn't really what we need. I think that like trying to look for alternative narratives in, in, in nature is super inspiring and interesting from an algorithmic perspective. And I, I can give an example of this. Um, which is what I would call the Rube Goldberg machine interpretation. Um, so this is a totally alternative way of thinking about it. Like if, so we, instead of thinking about it as a competition, and by the way, I'm not saying it can't be thought of that way. Like it's possible for there to be more than one valid interpretation of a system. So this is just a different interpretation. It's not saying the other one is wrong because they're just interpretations. But what the interesting thing about interpretations, is they lead to different types of ideas. And that's why it's val- it's useful to have different interpretations. So in this interpretation, what I, what I, what we think about is this, you know, instead of thinking evolution as a progression where like we went from one point to like better and better and better points, think about it instead as nothing is changing ever and we're always doing the same thing. And so in that view, what we have is a situation where there was a single cell, um, which is like presumably the first cell on earth and it reproduced and made another cell. And so the thing that it did, what it accomplished was it got another cell out of the first cell. And if you look at it that way, then like every single organism that's ever existed has only accomplished that at most. I mean, some have accomplished less because they didn't reproduce. But at most, that's it. That's, that's all they they've done. <laughs> well, I mean, look at what, I mean, if you have a child and you're a human, you know, that they, they were a single cell. What's the use of all the rest of it? It's not necessary. Like we can get from a single cell because you were a single cell, you know, when you started out and then all this, this huge digression, like multi-trillion cell digression, which is human life just to get another cell. It's ultimately just the same thing that first cell ever did. Um, and so. In this interpretation, the way you can think of it is think about it like a Rube Goldberg machine. Like we don't need all that to do what we did. Um, like we don't need like all of these like levers and pulleys and ramps and things falling down and fires lighting up to open your newspaper in the morning. Um, with some crazy complicated machine. I actually saw a guy who had this huge giant machine he built to open his newspaper just for fun. Yeah. We don't need any of he's that. A, yeah. He's kind of pretty famous, but we yeah. do need, uh, action comic hero movies, right? <laughs> we may need that. So I would have to yeah, go right. with that. But like, so in the same vein as like that Rube Goldberg machine that opens the newspaper, we don't need any of this stuff to get another cell. But what's happening, what's happening in nature is that we're riffing on this idea, on this theme of making another cell in infinite variations for eternity. Um, and that is why we're getting so much interesting stuff. It's that actually like the interesting stuff, like intelligence itself is totally orthogonal to like the constraints of the process, which is just saying make one cell from another. But if you riff on that theme forever, like you can get amazing things, just like if you built machines to open newspapers forever. Like eventually they can be as sophisticated as like the most sophisticated space station. Like, and and so interior to that, there could be inventions that are amazingly powerful, like human intelligence, Mm. but it's a completely unnecessary digression from what actually has to get accomplished. Unless it increases the ability to accomplish it. Yeah, but that, you could say that, but I would question. So that, that goes back to the metaphor, like the, the original narrative, which is the competition narrative. So it's really hard to drop that. We want to go back to that. So then you, yeah, people tend to go back in that direction. And, and, but the thing is like, you know, you don't, so the idea it's better for accomplishing it is like now this progression idea and things are getting better and we're in a competition and that's why things are changing. But the thing you have to remember is it's not clear what we mean when we say better. Well, high, higher probability of going from one cell to the next cell, let's well, say. Well, we don't. I mean, like a, a bacteria pr- reproduces many more times than a human. So any individual human is far inferior. And actually, also just in terms of total biomass on Earth, the bacteria have us totally beat, as do the ants. 
Um, so we're not winning on any objective metric. Biologists hate this kind of thing, by the way. When I say things like this, they're like, fitness isn't really meant to like compare like one species to another in this way. But that sort of, to me, is like being, well, because you're, you're kind of like setting the rules of the game. So I can't have this narrative. Um, like, I, I think we should be open to these kinds of like interspecies comparisons to like make the point of the narrative. Like, there is no superiority here. Like, this is total Rube Goldberg. Damn you, Ken. I am superior to the apes. <laughs> 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 okay, yeah, I don't Sorry, want to imply it, but I just think we're superior because they would totally object to that. <laughs> I know that they don't think that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, but it's just this idea that like there's some advantage to it. It's an advantage in some way. It doesn't have to be an advantage. All it is is that every it, anything that can be will be. That's the rule we need. And then we'll get to see everything, everything that's possible within the constraints. Like I think about it like it's almost like milk pouring out on a spilling out on a table. Like eventually it'll cover the whole table. You get to see everything except where there's obstacles in the way. Like it won't pour mm-hmm. around walls. And and so to me, the walls are a metaphor for the constraints that like you have to be a walking Xerox machine. Like there's all these places the milk could spill, like like riffing on people who died and never reproduced. Like maybe they had like genius. They could have been really interesting lineages, but they died before they reproduced. That's the that's the walls in the way of the milk. It couldn't spill in that direction. Um and so it doesn't go everywhere because of those constraints, but everywhere else it will go. And that's why we see all this cool stuff. Wait a billion years and you'll get like amazing stuff. Because everything that's possible is being revealed. So, well, one way to look at evolution is that it's terribly wasteful and inefficient for the objective of it, of keeping cells alive or something, you know, for passing cells along, mm-hmm. reproducing cells, because it makes all sorts of terrible things through random mutation that, that maybe in a different cons- environment could lead to something interesting. But so the, the, the idea of spaceship Earth, like it's this wonderful place that uh, is just perfectly suited for us. Um, the, the opposite side of the coin of that is this really harsh environment that only a few, th- yes, it's very complex, but only a few things would be truly viable within that very constraining uh, complexity. So then I think open-endedness seems even more inefficient than evolution because what you want to do is break down those constraints and, and really let it really explore. Mm. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I, I don't completely understand like with the, when open-endedness if you say open-endedness is less efficient than evolution, because to me, evolution is the canonical open-ended system. So it's sort of, that is what open-endedness is, is evolution. But in, but you've I've heard you talk about how, so evolution doesn't let everything continue, mm-hmm. right? Because yeah. it kills off the things that don't suit, its, suit the true, environment. True. Yeah. And I know we're, we're being very anthropomorphizing evolution, which is not good. But, yeah, yeah, but, but open-endedness would be much more forgiving, if I understand. I it. see, I see. Well, that's just... Um, that's one dimension of open-endedness, which is like the degree to which it's open. <laughs> like it's true that like the ultimate open-ended algorithm would just explore literally everything. Like every single organism would get to have children. What's the word for that gradient? The openness. Is there a word for that? Yeah, I, I mean that's like random search and stuff. Well, that's it's yeah, it's kind of like random search. Like everywhere the search goes, basically, we'll just keep going. Yeah, but it it's a population based random search. It's also I call it gentle earth, like a, it's like a metaphor in a way, like it's an earth gentle where, earth, gentle earth, like an earth where nobody where nobody fails to reproduce, where everybody reproduces. Um, I think it's interesting to think about gentle earth and what it would be like, you know, because it's like all of the branches of the tree of life that were pruned. What if they weren't? Um, what would be on this planet right now? And I think. You know, there'd be a lot of blobs that don't do anything on the planet right now. There'd also be a lot of interesting stuff that we've never got to see. So there'd be both. Um, and so, so when we talk about inefficiency, it's, um, it's, it, it's, it's a little uh, fuzzy. Like what, what is efficiency with respect to? Like inefficient with respect to, you know, producing efficient, viable creatures or maybe efficiency with respect to producing interesting new stuff. Well, I think just even in terms of resources, and I know that brings it very down to earth, but just the the resources, you know, like AI uh, gets gets knocked for being um, for taking up a lot of energy, for instance, right? But if you're going to run an open ended algorithm, if you're doing it well, I suppose it would take up almost infinitely more. Yeah, resources. I see. Yeah. It, it, okay. Yeah. In terms of resources, well, no. Yeah. I, I think I don't want to grant that because I think. I think actually it's a better, u- well, let's see. I think it's a better use of resources in some sense. Like it's like, let's, we have this amazing computational power. Let's say we do like some amazing supercomputer. Um, okay. You can't give me an algorithm that really uses it. 
Like, I, there's nothing to do with it. Like, what the heck is going to actually, like, exploit this resource? Now, I know that in deep learning, we, we can do some amazing things with, with really big computation. So I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about things that are even bigger than that. Like, I'm talking about things where I could run it for a thousand years and it would, like, change everything. Um, there's nothing available for that. So, like, the most efficient use of that would be an open-ended algorithm. It would actually exploit it to the maximal extent it could be exploited and show you everything you ever dreamed of would come out of it. In the long term, in the ambitious long term. In the long term, yeah. But I mean, that's what, that's, I mean, computation is space and time. So it's taking advantage of space and time. That's what it should be doing. It requires more patience, though. I mean, you know, like, like you've harped on, this is not in our culture right now. Patience is not part of our culture. Yeah. And it's a practical problem, too, because it's like, I mean, you can't, we're not going to get to see it in our lifetime. It's going to take a thousand years. So, ah. so it's true that like we, in practice, like if we're going to explore open-ended algorithms, we need to make ones that produce something worth our attention within our lifetime or else like we're not going to have the patience um, in practice. That's just a practical reality. Um, and so it is, this is like a real dilemma, I think, in the field is that you don't know when to stop your run. Um, because like, you know, if I ran it for five days, you know, and it was okay, but maybe if I had run it for 10, it would be amazing. Like, when do I actually stop and know what to say? Like, yeah, this is the evidence I need. Um, and that's just an aspect of open-endedness. You don't know when to stop it. Can I ask you about learning with respect to open-endedness? Because... So all these neural networks, and I know I'm focused on deep learning, which, and, and you, you know, you have plenty of deep learning experience and, and, you know, you even work on, um, neurally plausible backpropagation, like DOPA, what are they oh, called? Oh, DOPA? Oh, oh, the, um, yeah, the, the different, yeah, and the differentiable plasticity, um, with Thomas McConey. Yeah. Which is really, yeah, with yeah, Thomas McConey. his ideas. Yeah. Anyway, but, but then, you know, you you heavily have a, a evolutionary algorithm and, you know, neuroevolution type of background as well. Yeah. But learning, so so learning. I, I want to I want you to help me com in my own mind compare learning and open endedness because sure. learning has is normative. It has a direction. It actually, by definition, has a goal because you're learning toward you're getting mm -hmm. better at something, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And 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 some people think of even evolution as a really slow learning algorithm. But what mm -hmm. I think that you don't think of it that way. So so it's. Mm -hmm. More so, I almost want to compare learning and evolution because mm -hmm. you think of evolution and open endedness in general as sort of a search process that finds interesting things, and evolution might be it might find usefulness within the domain of life, mm -hmm. right? Do I need to think of learning more like that search space, or do I need to think about evolution and that searching more like a learning mechanism? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really interesting comparison um, to put evolution next to learning and say, well, how do they relate to each other? Or special open-ended evolution and learning. Um, I think one of the things that it points to is just that learning, in my view at least, as you alluded, can be open-ended. Um, I think that um, you know, open-endedness is not just only about evolution. Um, and that, that's an, an important kind of social point because like, the open-ended evolution community, um, by, by, by adopting that word evolution – um, is sort of implicitly excluding lots of people who work in things like deep learning. They don't mean to, I'm not saying they mean to, but like just the terminology excludes. And so I think it's really important to open up the terminology and, and acknowledge that open-endedness is a property of many kinds of systems that are not necessarily evolutionary systems. And that's what's so amazing about it, including learning systems. And so I think be because of that, we, we have to we have to allow for learning to be open-ended. So it's a slightly different than the just kind of normative view of learning that you're describing. And, and I think though that it's, it raises interesting questions, which is, which illustrates why it's important to at least tr try to think this way and explore this idea. Like, because if you think about it, like as a human being, clearly we can learn. We're learning systems. Like that's it's why we're inspired to do machine learning. Um, and, and, and yet, it's arguably like our path is very open ended as humans. I mean, we discussed this a little earlier, even in this program, like because you were you were pointing out like how like in, in sort of career paths, like in you know, a very kind of open ended discovery mm -hmm. process. And but I would argue even like um early in life, like babies and toddlers, like it's not clear to me that this is an objectively driven process. You know, when I watch yeah. my baby who's now one like learning how to walk or something. Congrats. The memories from way long ago for me. Uh, that, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. 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 And he like, he's been um, like, it's not just him, but I, I generally observe that it doesn't seem to me that, that babies 
have a goal in mind. They're just trying whatever they fit. And, and the thing is, they're falling stepping stones. It's like it, once they, they're shaking their arm around, they realize it hits something. They, they just realize you can hit things. That's kind of interesting. So then maybe you can hit things and then you realize, actually, I can hit things to places that are useful to me. And then maybe I can hold things. And it's like, this isn't because like the baby started out with this big plan. Like I got to figure out how to hold things. It just sort of banged into things, found stepping stones. But once it did something, it realized it could use that to do something else. Um, and, and so you might argue that like this whole developmental process, which certainly I think deserves to be called learning, is a completely open-ended process. It's just that it's also inevitable. So there's this, there's this interesting notion of inevitability and open-endedness that like at the beginning of an open-ended process, it's not necessarily the case that everything that happens is totally unpredictable. Like there can be open-ended processes where the early stages actually are pretty predictable. Like you're going to run into things like holding and walking and stuff like that as a baby, even if it's open-ended. But eventually, because our whole life is open-ended, it's not predictable. Like I, you could not predict when you're a baby that you're going to be running an interview show. Like that's not clear from the path. Yeah, that was my point from earlier. But even even doing this, like so I know that right now, this goes back to the motivation. As long as I do what I'm doing right now and give it my all, in 10 years, I'm probably not going to be doing this podcast, but right. it'll lead to something interesting that I value. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And But I think that's that's just an illustration of learning open-endedly. Like, in, in the process of discovery that you're going through, like, I think you, you certainly deserve to be credited with learning. Like, I mean, we could say it's something other than learning, but I think it's a form of learning. It's a learning without a curriculum is what it is. Like, no one has laid out before you the steps that you should take along this path you just are stumbling through them. But but as you stumble through them, you are actually learning a lot um, and becoming more more wise about like, you know, all these aspects of the world, which are just the ones you encountered, which are different than the ones I encountered. But all of us have a different path like that. And I think that, that there's a lot of wisdom gained along each of those paths. And that's learning. All right, Ken, let's, uh, let's switch gears for the last little bit here. Sure. Um, uh, so I, I know you've had an interest in, in brains and in the way that brains work, uh, you know, going back mm-hmm. to the beginnings of your uh, interests in, you know, before machine learning, I think. I, I don't know if that's what you, got you into the whole thing. And and you often say, who knows? At the end of a talk, you say, who knows? Uh, open-endedness may just very well get us to AGI without trying. And then, but then you also show a picture of a brain and, and say AGI and, and you say, and get us to a brain. Are do you think of AGI as human level intelligence or is there some other way that we should think about it? Mm. And then I want to talk about intelligence in general uh, eventually as well. But Cool. Um, yeah, I, I think that, so AGI is, well, it, it, these terms are really contentious for some reason. Yes. Like there's, <laughs> there's AI, no, there's AGI, there's a, there's a human level intelligence. Uh, it's very controversial. And a strong open endedness. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there's a new one I threw in there. Um, and but so like I, I'm not as uh, tied to necessarily a specific terminology, but I think I it, like with an understanding of what AI is really meaning to to articulate. It's 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 an idea. Well, I guess that um, is AGI intelligence. So uh, or is it human intelligence? It's well, AGI refers to generality because the artificial general intelligence is what it stands for. And I guess that. In some ways, it may be an oversimplification, I guess, in my view of what we're actually aiming for. Like, cause of the word general is, is promoted so much there. Like, it's not like only generality yeah. is really the issue here. Um, but generality is an issue. It's just there's other issues. Um, and I understand like the allure of generality because it's based on like, we seem to be able to do so many things that like we're basically general intelligence, you could say. But the thing that it kind of misses is the fact that like we're also like extreme specialists. In other words, we specialize, like our lives are about specializing. Like it's very unusual you find a master in two domains, let alone three. I don't like, you know, like right. like one of the top 10 best basketball players in the world and the top 10 physicists in the world at the same time. Like it just doesn't happen. Um, and that's because people specialize over their lifetime when they become great at something. Um, and so just talk about general intelligence kind of papers over or, or fuzzes that out. Um, that like the, the extreme specialization is also a characteristic of, of being human. Um, mm. and we may, we may theorize that, that somehow that, that won't be in the age yet. Like maybe the age yet, we imagine something that actually is a master of everything. So it's not like a human because humans don't seem to do that. But I would argue that that might actually not work. 
Like maybe, maybe there's a reason that like we also need to specialize. We have amazing general capabilities. I'm not denying that, but we also have amazing specialization capabilities. So it's very complex, like how these things mix together. Um, and so I don't think the terminology necessarily elicits all of that, but I mean, we can use that terminology it's just if we want to have something to talk about, it's fair enough to me to call it AGI. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we can just call it AI. We can call it whatever you want to call it. Okay, well, you know, considering like open endedness, mm-hmm. should AI take any guidance from looking at brains for or or just any natural mm. intelligent yeah. processes? Yeah, I mean, at least in the sense I mentioned about babies and open endedness throughout lifetime. But that's almost an objective, right? Sorry to interrupt. Hmm. Is it is it almost an objective? Um well, now what exactly are we saying is an objective there? Well, I don't. In some sense, it seems antithetical to to open endedness to say if we want to solve AI or or create AI, what we should do is pay attention to brains, for instance. Uh huh. If we wanted, to, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Shouldn't we explore beyond the boundaries of what brains can do yeah, and what yeah. humans can do? Shouldn't should we not? Should we use that as guidance? Well, the confusion that's happening here is because we're we're actually in an open ended sandwich. Because there's open-endedness on both sides of us. Like, the open-endedness that leads to us is very different from the open-endedness that's inside of us. You know, we are we are open-ended. That's the open-endedness inside of us. So, your lifetime mm-hmm. has an open-ended aspect to it. And your intelligence is very tied in with being open-ended, I think. I think human intelligence, maybe the pinnacle of what makes human intelligence human is its open-endedness. Like, not problem-solving, but the this tendency we have to explore. Uh, we're just amazing at that. And that's why there is a history of invention and civilization and so forth. But there's also the open-endedness that precedes us. That's a completely different thing. That is the explanation for how we got the brain we have, which is evolution. Um, and so, like, we're in the middle of that. And so, you can you can conflate those two things when you just talk about open-endedness because they're, they're different from each other. But it's really interesting that they both are open-ended. Um, because, like, you could say that, well, like, to understand the open-endedness that precedes us, it won't help us to create a goal, which is a target that the, op- which is the open-endedness, which is inside of us. Like that might be an argument you could make because that suddenly does sound like it's a goal. But I think that's mm-hmm. conflating two different things. Like when I'm saying that the open-endedness that's inside of us is interesting from like a neuroscientific point of view in forming AI, it's about like the, the question, once you, when you get to us, what is it actually like? Like what kind of structure do you expect to get? Um, if it's like a human, like it's got to have this open-ended property to it, like the cognitive aspect of it is going to be open-ended. And, and I'm just saying that I think that that sometimes is, is underemphasized, like in AI's interpretation of cognition, because it, it's oh. often viewed sort of as a problem solver or like a, or like a classifier or, or something like that. Um, and, and so, and so it might be helpful for us in understanding what kind of thing we're aspiring to here to realize that there's this really, really magnificent aspect of our humanity, you know, which is our open-endedness, which might be getting a little bit of short shrift. Um, and, and I would like to understand what actually accounts for that, you know, cause like a lot of our, a lot of our, the metaphors that we're using, like when we think about things like backpropagation are related to the idea that there's a target that we're moving towards. Um, but what is actually the cognitive apparatus of open-endedness from an algorithmic point of view or like a neural propagation point of view? I mean, this is an extremely hard question to answer because um, mm-hmm. it's like t- to reduce very abstract concepts into real like neural network explanations is like who knows when that's going to happen. But it's still, I think, interesting to think about that. And then on the other end, the evolutionary side is like it's a whole other reason that we need to think about it because we might need it to get to that point. I mean, do you think that our conception of evolution or just – the ontology of <laughs> how biology works. Are we, there? are we there? Have we solved it? I mean, I know that there's remaining questions in evolution, but mm. is there going to be a radical new theory idea mm. that is going to frame our understanding of, you know, that, that can encompass something like yeah. open-endedness and, and our cognitive abilities like that? Well, I think we're not, yeah, I don't think we're there sort of as I, as I kind of hinted before, like I don't think we have the full theory, whatever that is that like accounts for open-endedness yeah. in evolution. I don't think we're there. 
Um, cause again, I think that to get there, if we were there, then we could actually just implement it as an algorithm and we'd be done today. Right. And so there's something we still don't fully understand, but I think we're closer. Uh, we do understand some important ingredients, I believe, at this point. Um, and so that then leads to this question of the a grand theory and basically a shift in theory and evolutionary theory. And that leads to all kinds of controversy is what I've noticed. Like it's the evolutionary theory is, is, is just such a crowning achievement of science that like saying that there's like a fundamental shift even suggesting yeah. it is, is like just like, yeah. <laughs> like a her- absolute heresy um, that there even might be one. Um, and so um, like because because I think what scientists are afraid of is that you're hinting that like some of the main underpinnings of the theory are wrong, the current theory. And that's that 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 might that's not necessarily true. Just because we see we have a fundamental shift in understanding doesn't mean that some underpinnings are wrong. You know, like there's still selection going on. I mean, these things are happening. Um, and so somehow you have to like thread that needle of like preserving the parts that and acknowledging that there are parts that are worth preserving here, but still saying that there are still fundamental insights to be had. Like broad, broadening the, I'm sorry. Broadening, yeah. Broadening like the, the overall uh, narrative uh, of, of what's going on. Um, that's why I mentioned like having new narratives, like new interpretations is helpful. Um, and, and, but, but to really do that, I, I doubt I'm the person because, because I'm not a biologist, so I'm not equipped. Cause like this is like it's so the, the politics are just uh, so complex and I probably don't even begin <laughs> to understand them. But I've seen other people, like I've seen people who thought what I, some of our stuff was interesting, who, who were invested more in biology who tried to kind of push the needle a little there with some, some new theories. And, and I've seen that they run into dramatic resistance. Um, and it's probably appropriate because the theory is, is, is so powerful. Yeah. Um, yeah. but, but I do think like that we're going to have to do some updates because, because again, I believe that you, you can't really claim to understand what's going on if you can't implement it. So my bar is kind of the AI bar. All right, if you're if you go if you biologists really understand it so well, then just write a program, and we should see we should see nature in all its glory inside the computer. It is it is ironic though the new, uh, you know, oh you dare question Darwin, burn him at the stake. <laughs> you know the the new heresies. Yeah. It's, that's fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a little ironic. So neuroscience is okay. So I mean, this podcast is tries to at least <laughs> ostensibly is about the interface of neuroscience and AI. And neuroscience gets a lot of criticism these days for sort of being stamp collecting and not having enough theory uh, driving the experiments. You know, mm-hmm. we're collecting more and more data, but then, oh, where's the theory that will, sure. you know, that we can f- frame the narrative of and then do better experiments and yeah. uh, understand what the data is about. Does neuroscience need open-endedness? that type of pursuit because we write you know i'm not in Mm. it anymore they Mm -hmm. write grants to, like you said earlier to pretend like Mm. they're (laughs) working on their grant question right yeah yeah Uh, and then make progress that way but but does there need to be a more open-ended sort of pursuit in neuroscience do you think i would guess the answer is yes but i I want to admit that i'm not a neuroscientist so Mm -hmm. so I, i can't really credibly critique the field but it's like every field seems like they, they need more open-endedness. I would guess that in neuroscience, what that means is it's about the idea that, you know, there are some neural phenomena that I just want to look at, but I don't really know what they are. <laughs> like, I don't know what they mean. I don't know what they explain. I don't have a theory. I don't know. But I just have a gut feeling that, like, this is interesting. Um, and that's why I want to, I want, give me $500,000 so I can look at this. And I bet you that's mm-hmm. like impossible. Like you can't say that. Yes. Um, and yeah. that is, uh, that is a sense in which it could be more open-ended, um, is that we should let people say that. Um, because like some of our discoveries are going to be because something's interesting, not because we even know what the heck it is, especially in a system as complex as this one. Um, and our neuroscientists that have been trained for like 30 years or something before they become a professor, whatever they are, a scientist. <laughs> they, oh God, that's depressing. You know, they, they, they deserve a little bit of, of, of acknowledgement of like that effort that we put into them. Like they also put in effort, but society has invested in them for decades. Imagine how much we've spent on this. Like, can't we just acknowledge that after all those decades, maybe they ha- their intuition is worth following? 
like that something's mm. interesting. Like they don't have to have a theory. Like they're they're mature enough now as scientists, they actually might have be onto something when they have a gut feeling. I'm not saying they shouldn't have to justify their feelings at all. Like they, it's I wouldn't accept a grant that just said this is cool. Like let's look at it. <laughs> um, but I can explain I to you. Yeah. I can explain why something's interesting to you without knowing where it's going. Like I should be able to do that. We don't challenge ourselves to do that enough. I think. Like just to say this is why I think this is really cool, and I will not tell you what's going to happen if I investigate it. Um, but it's not like we're not idiots here like who can't communicate with each other just because we don't have an objective. Like there's a lot of other stuff we could be talking about other than just where we're going because we just don't know. I mean, that's the nature of exploration, which is what science should be about. So yeah, I think I'm, I'm sure that neuroscience, because it is, it is one of these fields where there's so much we don't know and we're in such a morass of complexity that absolutely it could be better served by allowing some of that kind of exploratory investigation. I'm sure that's true. Not saying it should all be that way. Like That's the straw man everybody likes to attack. Like, we can't get rid of all objectives. That's crazy. I'm not saying right. we should get rid of all objectives. No, of course not. But let's put some resources into this kind of thing and start acknowledging that we vested enough in these people so that their intuitions actually matter. But th this is a different sort of, usually when people think of a bottom-up approach, they think of a data-driven approach, like see what's in the data, collect the data, look for patterns, and then use those patterns to map onto whatever cognitive function that you mm. think you might be working, wa working on, etc. But what, uh, what open-endedness suggests and what you're suggesting, if I have it right, is that it's a, a, a different kind of bottom-up approach that explores, uh, I don't know if intuitions is the right is the right word for it, but it, 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 do I have that right? Is it? Do you see it as a bottom-up kind of approach, not just to neuroscience, but to AI as well? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's true. I, I see the bottom-up, top-down point. Um, it's it is maybe um, kind of bottom. Is it bottom-up? I have to think about it. Does it really mean? Is it really bottom-up? Because it, um, it's not going from theories of what. Yeah. So in in neuroscience, there's this kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. tension between creating theories versus doing experiments and collecting data at the, you know, on the implementation level versus yeah, creating yeah. theories about what's computationally going that's on. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. It, it does seem like that that's reasonable to say. So yeah, it's, it is about, it's kind of like, what would happen if I did this? Like, it's, I don't know, uh, but I'd like to know. Um, but it's not just, you know, yeah, it's not just collecting tons of data. I mean, maybe data collection is sort of open-ended. I mean, that, like, if it's just for the sake of getting the data, like, I don't know what I'm going to see, but I'm just looking at it. Um, then, then you're kind of saying, I don't know, I just want to look at this thing. That's what I want to be paid to do. Um, so, so, like, yeah, there's some degree of open-endedness there. So, Ken, you were at the University of Central Florida, and then you went to, I think I have this right, you went to Uber uh, AI Labs, now you're at OpenAI, congratulations on the, wow, it's a very new new job, right? What, a yeah. couple months old? Uh, four months, yeah. Yeah, thanks. What, what are you doing? What's going on at OpenAI? What, you're heading a, a team of open-ended, what do you call them, open-ended-ers? What do you call <laughs> your team? Well, just the open-endedness team. Um, but okay. I haven't, yeah, oh, okay. I gotta think, maybe we should call ourselves open-endeders, is it? That's a tough term to say. No, that's terrible. You, yeah, you, it won't not, take you long yeah, to come up with something better than that. Not very catchy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I started the open endedness team at OpenAI, um, which is great because that's what we've been talking about here. Um, so yeah, I'm really trying to um, push forward the progress that we've just been discussing. And OpenAI saw the potential for open endedness to dovetail with the aspirations of AGI, which I agree with. Um, and I think that the amazing talent and resources there with respect to machine learning and deep learning are, are very compatible and complementary to the goals of open-endedness and open-endedness is complementary to the, to their goals as well. So I think it's a really good, uh, good pairing uh, of ideas and makes it a great place to be, uh, to be exploring this topic. So it's more of the same. You're just on a, on a different scale and with a different team sort of. In a way. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that. It's like, I guess it's the first time that I've really led a team that's just is like explicitly called open-endedness. Um, like my entire career before this, I think I've been sort of implicitly trying to pursue open-endedness and not because I necessarily always like hiding it or something, but I don't think I, I really fully crystallized what I'm really interested in until maybe recently. Like I, I was probably everything I've been doing, like you could see how it has something to do with open-endedness, like going back to neat or something like that. Um, which is like evolving, increasingly complex neural networks, but I wouldn't have used that term back then. And, 
you know, I just kind of gradually realized that's what I've been really, what's been really been inspiring me for some reason. I don't know why I'm so inspired by this. Um, but so like, this is like, I finally, yeah, like made it concrete. So it's explicit. Let's pursue open-endedness. Yeah. That, that must be satisfying. Yeah, it is satisfying. It's, um, yeah, it's weird. I mean, I, I once I wrote something when I was like 16, like a program, cause I just read about evolution in, in the biology textbook. And I was like, this should be, I could write this in, in, in basic, basically it was a programming language that I knew. Um, and <laughs> So it sounded like a program. I was like, this must be, but the thing I really wanted to do when I was 16 was, was I was hoping like something would evolve that was like weird or interesting. Like I had no goal in mind. I just was like, some cool stuff might happen. And I created the most crazy program ever. Like I don't, it's not scientifically valuable at all. Um, but, um, but it was, it's interesting to think back to that, like that going back like to when I was 16, I was like, pretty much pursuing open endedness, like right there, um, for decades ago. So I think I just somehow, I don't know why. It's just like what I'm interested in. And so it's really great, yeah, to finally do it. Yeah, it's like just justifying your entire implicit career up to now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It feels like it's a, a sub-validation or something, like I'm actually doing open this for real now. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing where things go, where, you know, where it takes you. If you're right, you'll not be studying open-endedness in the future sometime, right? <laughs> <laughs> why, why? Because it well, because the search space is so vast, and you're, you're amenable to searching within that space. Yeah, I agree <laughs> completely. Like, yeah, who knows? I, I could see myself deviating. So that's true. There was one thing uh, I wanted to ask you before I let you go about open endedness um, and its relation. I have like such a long list. You wouldn't. I should just send you my notes, although it would take you <laughs> so long to read them. Because I just had so many questions. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm sure I'm not gonna it. send you my notes. <laughs> um, but one of the, you know, because so many things come to mind when you let yourself swim in this space a little bit. And one of those is, so there's this idea of focused learning and is it called diffuse thinking, focused thinking, diffuse thinking. Anyway, it's yeah. the, the thing where you're working hard on a problem, you're really focused on it, you kind of get stuck and you kind of keep yeah. hammering at it. And then you walk away and you make one of those super complex sandwiches that we talked about earlier. And you, and you take a shower and then you, you yeah. know, you're unfocused and your unconscious yeah, yeah, processes... Yeah. Is that open-endedness at work in the brain? Well, there's, that's a really interesting question. I mean, again, another interesting question um, that I've thought about. And it's, it has some elements of when we talk about open-endedness. Like, for example, one of the elements is you're not trying to solve the problem and you solve it. Like that, That's clearly like a kind of a non-objective process in that sense, at least. Like, it, like I became – what finally made it possible to figure this out was to stop trying to solve it. Um, and that's like, uh, you know, to achieve your highest goals, you must be willing to abandon them. It's like totally compatible with that notion. But then the other aspect of it is that it's, it's kind of mysterious, like, because I don't actually know what is going on subconsciously, because it's subconscious. So, mm-hmm. like, I went in the shower, and then it popped out, and, like, was, was the thing happening subconsciously actually open-ended itself? Like, that I don't know what's going on. It's possible. Um, like, I, I think it's plausible. Like, your brain is following stepping stones kind of casually. Um, and because of that, it's willing to, to entertain options that, like, you wouldn't normally consciously consider. Um, and so maybe that, that was what freed you and liberated you to actually find a different path in, like back to where like actually leads, does lead to where you're hoping to go. Um, and so uh, it doesn't seem crazy to think stuff like that could be true. And I've definitely experienced it too. Like I, I actually explicitly intentionally try not to think about things that are like, when I realize that there's like a really big problem that I wish I could solve, I just shut it down for a few months. I'm like, I'm not even going to think about it. Um, wow, months and wow. yeah yeah because i'm like i just feel like it's not the time like as soon as you as soon as i have a feeling like i'm really trying hard then i'm like this is a sign that it's not the right time to do this um because that's very objective Fuck. like when you're like trying to do it like really hard and it's like it's too hard of a problem like really hard problems are not like that you can't just try them um you gotta let it kind of settle in in some way that like you don't know what's going on but it might happen so I actually try to do that <laughs> Oh, that's really great. That means my whole life is a waste because I'm everything seems very hard. You know the story about Edison, um, the way that he would um, come up with solve problems, solve things that he was working on. He uh, he would hold two metal, I think two metal balls in his hand, and sit down in his chair and like start to doze off. And as he would doze off, he would drop the metal balls and they would fall into this metal pan and make this loud noise and wake him up. And often that would, he'd have the solution. Huh. That's the, maybe that's urban legend, but you know, it be, sounds nice. But that's a fun one. Yeah, I actually didn't, I didn't know that. It sounds like something I should have known about. Like it's a cool legend at least. Um, 
Yeah, like that is, I mean, the subconscious and just, it's, yeah, it's a little more uh, um, amorphous than like, it's not like algorithmic because you can't really say, well, what is, what are we proposing here to do? But, but like, it seems, it seems somehow about the same kind of stuff. Um, and I feel, it feels like it, like viscerally, like when I have an idea that came from like not thinking about something, it doesn't feel like I was trying, you know, it just, it feels like it came out of left field. That's why it's like a eureka type of situation. You know, you're like, where yeah. did that come from? <laughs> like, it just like popped in. Yeah. Which is beautiful and frustrating. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Partly because you don't know if you can ever do it again. Like there's, oh, there's no formula God. to that. So I, I always feel worried if that's how I thought of something. Because I'm like, yeah. I don't know what I just did. Like I, I don't, can't repeat the process. Right. Well, this has been really fun. Um, I appreciate you taking the, the time with me and, 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 and letting me uh, <laughs> ask my silly questions of you. You must get so many silly questions uh, from people. Interesting questions, let's say. I don't from, think they're silly. I, they were really, yeah. it was a great conversation. Um, yeah, these are great questions. Well, I appreciate it. I wish you luck moving, miss you luck moving forward. Although, of course, you don't need it. But, but thanks, Ken. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. It was really fun. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time.